Thank you, Alistair, very much indeed for reading for us. May I add my welcome to you and uh, delighted to see you. And I hope, as Wes says, this becomes part of a regular uh, slot in your diary on a Tuesday lunchtime as we spend time together in John's Gospel. Uh, my aim at this lunchtime is for us to explore the idea that Jesus is the only one with all of God's authority to accomplish the task that only God can do. Uh, if you want a slightly shorter summary, that Jesus is God's man for God's job. Uh, and if the question last week was, how can we know, that is, how can we know anything about God unless we're given revelation from God, no one has ever seen God, then the question this week is, on whose authority? Or, if you want it slightly more colloquially, says who? So, over these Tuesday lunchtimes, as Ware said, we're looking at the issue of life. I've called the series Life at Work, or Get a Life. And we are looking at John's Gospel, and John, the eyewitness and uh, authorised uh, teacher of uh, Jesus' teaching, is um, our authority, not me for a second. It's uh, John, the eyewitness. Uh, and this week, I want us to see that Jesus Christ is the only one with all of God's authority to do the job that only God can do. And if you want a key verse, and that's what I'm trying to do, to select key verses as we go through these first four chapters of John's Gospel, it would be uh, sentence 29 there, uh, just after the break in the page. The next day, John the Baptist, that's not John the author of the Gospel, it's John the Baptist, a different figure, saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I want to say that this places Jesus in a different category to any other truth claim or any other offer of life that we might find in the marketplace of ideas in 21st century London. 14 years ago, yesterday, I started work here um, in this city congregation back in the 1990s, and I remember in great trepidation, um, uh, starting up work here, uh, and wondering what on earth does the city have to say about life. So I went to the city bookstore, Waterstones, down in uh, uh, Leadenhall Market, and in those days there was a half bay on mind, body, and spirit, and it was the day of postmodern kind of teaching, and I picked up, I think, a book on Wicca or something like that. It was all the rage in those days. And two weeks ago, knowing that I was going to be teaching on this passage, I thought, well, you know, what, what does the city have to say? I know it's not all the city, but what's on offer? So I went back to Waterstones downstairs, and the half bay has grown by 600% in 14 years, which is not bad, and there are now three bays. And I discovered this little book, which Waterstones have as their recommended read as uh, the top seller on body, mind, and spirit this is what it has to say about wealth and money. To attract money, focus on wealth. It's impossible to bring more money into your life when you focus on the lack of it. It's helpful to use your imagination and make believe you already have the money you want. Play games of having wealth and you will feel better about money. As you feel better about it, more will flow into your life. Make it your intention to look at everything you like and say to yourself, I can afford that, I can buy it you will shift your thinking and begin to feel better about money. Southern Europe's been doing that for the last 15 years or so. <laughs> Visualize checks in the mail. Tip the balance of your thoughts to wealth. Think wealth. Well, it's typical self-help, isn't it? Uh, power of positive thinking and that sort of nonsense that no doubt one comes across from time to time. And we laugh at it. But in reality, for vast numbers of people, uh, I guess friends and neighbors, the authority on which we base our life, and indeed our eternity, carries little more weight than Waterstone's recommended book on body, mind, and spirit. I remember reading the first part of Keith Richards' biography. I couldn't read it at all. It's too sordid. But the first part of Keith Richards' biography, we sat around reading John Stuart, Stuart Mill on liberty out of which came the philosophy of the Rolling Stones and the 60s revolution. 
Says who? What kind of authority is that to base your life on? John Stuart Mill. What, what basis of authority is it? And so if the question for last week was, uh, how can we know? The question this week is, if I may ask the personal question, on what basis of authority do you make the major decisions of your life? And I want us to see in these opening verses of John's Gospel that we have here an authority that is unique. In fact, I've got a rocket for one of the young city guys. I normally go through my talk, uh, sort of say, well, this is what we're going to be talking about tomorrow, and we look at the passage together with somebody. And this uh, guy, I can't see him here. He gave me a rocket yesterday. Sh you shouldn't even mention this book. Jesus is in a completely different category, William. That's outrageous. And, and so I've sort of tried to get around it by making the point that he's in such a different category. And I want to begin by looking at this issue of accreditation, and I want us to see that Jesus has a triple A rating. He is the Lamb of God. That is, he has God's authorization, and I guess in a sense we could go to any number of areas. We could go to his teaching, we could go to his life, its perfect life, we could go to his miracles, we could go to his death and resurrection. But right at the start of this gospel, what John the gospel writer does is to take us to John the Baptist and his aim is by exploring the teaching of John the Baptist to show us that Jesus is God's man and that Jesus sort of doesn't just break into history as a kind of random event, unexpected, unannounced, just a kind of arriving out of the blue, some sort of rogue figure, but that Jesus is connected to the whole history of God's revelation over centuries and millennia, and therefore he comes with a great weight of authority, because he is God's man. Let's look for a moment then as we look at this attestation, accreditation of Jesus at what John the Baptist had to say. Well, John the Baptist was a public figure of national prominence. You can see that in verses 19 to 22. The priests and the Levites, there in verse 19, Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him. They were the compliance department of the Jewish temple, men from the temple equivalent of the FSA. John was clearly a very public figure we read elsewhere that all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem went out to be baptized. So Jerusalem was empty, a bit like London and the Olympics, as everybody went out to John the Baptist. This was a national and an international phenomenon. We wake up to read of Olympic parades and open, uh, US Open victories, but in those days you would have woken up to read about John the Baptist. Claire Balding would have been the studio anchor, and Krish Guru Murphy would have been poolside as the Baptist conducted his ministry. And do you notice that these people are so impressed by John the Baptist, they ask, are you the Messiah? Now, we come across people every now and then who claim to be the Messiah, and usually we either cart them away or elect them to be prime minister. But as far as John the Baptist was concerned, he was so impressive, such a big figure, he didn't claim to be the Messiah, but people said of him, you must be the Messiah. Are you the prophet, the long-expected prophet like Moses? Are you Elijah, the great prophet of restoration? Are you the Christ, the Messiah, they said. A prominent, impressive public figure. And then from verse 22 and 23, you can see he is an, he is an historic figure of theological significance significance. Now, there's no doubt he's historic. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John record uh, John the Baptist's life and teaching. And Josephus, the Jewish historian, also writes independently of John the Baptist in his antiquities. So there is no doubt that John the Baptist was an historical figure. But look at what he says of himself in verse 23. I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now that is a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 40, where God promised to send a rescuer to his people who would provide a perfect match, it's called a double, 
to pay for their sins, a double. But he said, I will send a messenger before me to prepare the people. And so John the Baptist breaks into this big kind of uh, theological context of all of the Old Testament, announcing that he is the voice to prepare the arrival of God himself as God breaks in uh, to our planet. And if you look at verse 23, you'll see that is, uh, is there, make straight the way of the Lord. John the Baptist understood himself to be making ready the way for God himself to arrive. So he's a public figure of national prominence, he's an historic figure of theological significance, but he's a preparatory figure of what you might call secondary relevance. Because you'll notice in verse 26, 27, and 28 that when they ask him, if you're not the Christ, not the Elijah, not the prophet, he says, I baptize you with water. All I can do is get you wet, which is what all anybody can do who baptizes you in church. They just get you wet. But among you stands one you don't know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. You think I'm great? You reckon I might be the Messiah or the Christ? I'm not even worthy of untying the sandals of the one who is to come. Uh, in order to grasp just how significant a claim that is about Jesus, we have to realize that to untie the sandals of someone in first century Jewish culture, you wouldn't even allow your Hebrew slave to do. You only allowed your migrant worker, a Gentile, to do that. Such was the kind of derogatory nature, filthy streets, donkeys as the main mode of transport, and so on and so forth. So think for a moment of the greatest figure you can imagine from the 20th century. I don't know who it might be. I mean, some would say Churchill, others would say Nelson Mandela, somebody else might say Alec Ferguson, but whoever it is you think is the greatest figure of the 20th century. And here is John the Baptist, who's not just a public prominent figure, but also a hugely theologically significant figure connecting right back into the theological history of the Old Testament with all these big promises and plans of God. And he says, well, you think I'm big? In relation to the one who is to come, I'm no different to a migrant worker. Now, that is, I think, some authorization but it does more than uh, simply show that Jesus is in a different category because John is connected to the Old Testament revelation. And therefore it connects Jesus to this whole stream, what the theologians call the meta-narrative, which is a posh way of saying the big picture of what God has been doing over centuries and millennia. <coughs> And you can see that built upon by the titles that G John the Baptist then gives to Jesus as he points Jesus out in person. See, the, the word of eternity is the Christ of history. And John the Baptist, as he prepares the way, points to Jesus, verse 29. He saw Jesus coming towards him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. Now, the Lamb is a sacrificial image of a Lamb who gives his life in order that sin might be forgiven. Now look down the page to sentence 33. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain... This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now, the one on whom the Spirit descends in the, the, the Old Testament is always God's anointed king and ruler. The Spirit descended on Saul. The Spirit descended on King David. The Spirit descended on Gideon. The mark of the anointed king and ruler of God's people was that the Spirit descended upon him. But always in those circumstances, the Spirit did not remain. And now, says John the Baptist, here is a break, if you like, in the history of God's people. Not only is he the Lamb of God who is going to take away the sin of the world, he is also the anointed ruler on whom God's Spirit descends and remains. 
And therefore, he gives him that third title, this is the Son of God. Now, do you see what I mean when I begin to suggest that Jesus is the only one with all God's authority? You will not find in any, any major religion or philosophy in the world a figure, a human, breaking into history with claims made about him like that. It is unique. He is the only one with all God's authority. The sacrificial lamb, the appointed king, the anointed ruler. I wonder how big Jesus is in your thinking. And whether the Jesus of our thinking bears any relation to the real life Jesus, the Jesus of history. As a small boy, I grew up on a farm, and the biggest excitement from about the age of three to five was when lorries came to our farm and invariably got stuck. And I'd forgotten about this, but my father was telling me the other day that we all children used to lean out of the windows shouting to my father, who was with the lorry driver, Daddy, Daddy, is he going to get stuck? Is he going to get stuck? Is he going to get stuck? I can't imagine what the lorry drivers thought of it, but it was the biggest excitement. And not only did we lean out of the window shouting and anticipating, hopefully, that this great event would happen, we also had our own dinky toy lorries. And we would kind of be making stuck lorry kind of games and all the rest of it as all of this was going on. Of course, if you put that dinky toy, that little matchbox toy, next to the real McCoy, it was a a pitiful picture. Nothing like it. And I wonder if our view of Jesus matches the Jesus that is being presented here. Part of God's great purposes and plans over centuries and millennia. The Lamb of God, not just who takes away my own personal little sin, which he does and he must if I'm going to have life from God, but the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who actually deals with the major problem that our world faces and has faced since the day of the first rebellion against its creator. The Lamb of God who will remove the sin of the world such that if we personally turn to him we can have our sins forgiven, but who will deal with the great problem that our world faces. The one on whom the Spirit descends and remains, the anointed King and ruler of God, the Son of God. Dinky toy Jesus produces dinky toy faith. And dinky toy faith does not stand up in aggressive, harsh, real world secularist culture. And as we come to these opening chapters of of John's gospel, we begin to see our understanding of Jesus being stretched and expanded into a real life Jesus, the real McCoy who is the Jesus of history. And as we come back now to where we began, I think that then begins to enable us to ask some searching questions of our culture in a, in, a, in a gracious way, in an appropriate way. It enables us to begin to say not just, how do you know? How do you know life is... How do you know this is going to happen? On what basis do you have your knowledge about life, eternity, what is right, what is wrong? But also... Who says? On what authority? I was in uh, uh, here on Saturday morning, and um, uh, the guys from the Leadenhall Tower, building that terrific building there, always come and sit on the benches just outside, and uh, they're they're there every day. And very, very tragically, one of the um, workers there has just uh, committed suicide. It's a terrible thing, and we heard about it last week, and I was talking to them about it. It's actually the third suicide in the city in the last three weeks. And uh, as we were chatting, you know, one of them stayed to talk. He didn't know the person. Actually, this individual came from a very strong Christian family, but had completely thrown over all of his parents' faith. And he'd not actually seen his father for over ten years. It's a really tragic situation. And we got talking, and because of the context, I began to ask him about life. And sensitively, I hope, began to pose the says who question. What do you think we're here for? 
and a whole string of kind of ideas picked up from here, there, and everywhere. Says who? On what basis do you form that opinion? Where's your authority? What do you think will happen when we die? Surely that's the most important question you're ever going to face when you meet your creator and are kind of, well, I'll answer that when I get there. Says who? What kind of authority is that for the biggest question you're ever going to face? How do you think we should conduct our lives now, today? What, what makes you think that? On what basis do you form that authority, what, on that, that opinion? And as we were chatting, it transpired that really the opinions were a hodgepodge of, you know, what you see on Waterloo Road, or Friends, what you read in the weekend supplement, what's been picked up from John Stuart Mill over the years, and secondhand from Keith Richards, and so on and so forth. And on a profound ignorance of Jesus Christ. And so I asked him the question as we finished, what, would you conduct decisions and decision making in any other area of life on the basis of that authority? I mean, if you were purchasing a house, would you say, oh, well, Everybody else seems to think it's an all right kind of house and there are other people living nearby and so I suppose I might just as well do it. Or if you were thinking of taking out a pension or a pension plan, would you say, oh, well, I'll just wait till it gets till I'm 65 or 75 or whatever age it is going to be these days, maybe 85, some of you tell us. Oh, I'll just wait and see. And it transpired that in no other area of life would he ever make a decision on such incredibly shaky authority. And yet the big decisions of life were being made on the basis of profound ignorance about Jesus and what Granny said. Well, I want to suggest that when we come to Jesus, we'll look at the rest of that sentence and the next verse is uh, uh, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world next week as we push forward to the end of the chapter. But I want to suggest that when it comes to Jesus, we find a figure who has all God's authority, authorized by God. We'll, we'll look at his life, we'll look at his teaching, and we'll look at his miracles, and we'll look at his death and resurrection, and that's all to come. But here, what John is wanting to see is that he is connected with God's plans and purposes over centuries and millennia, and he comes with all God's authority on life and death, eternity, heaven, hell, and he can be trusted. Well, we've just begun to explore very briefly 15 verses of John's Gospel. I, I totted up um, just before I came down. Um, there are 878 more verses in John's Gospel. And you may be sitting there saying, well, you know, how can I possibly think that, believe that? And I want to add uh, to Wes's invitation to join in a guided read-through of John so that you can explore further. You know, can we really trust him? How does his authority, authority actually cash out? What does he teach us about life? Join us next Tuesday. And if you would like to have a guided read-through with somebody else who's been trained to help with that, then do please just uh, tick the box you'll find there on the form. Let's pray together. Behold the Lamb of God. Our Father, we praise you that he is at your figure, that you had prepared and planned for his arrival for centuries, millennia, from before the beginning of eternity. We thank you that he is the one on whom the Spirit descended and remains, that he is your anointed King and ruler. We thank you that as we come to Jesus, we find one with real authority, authority that comes from outside, authority that comes from you. And we pray, Lord, that you would grant us a greater understanding of the Lord Jesus for who he is. So a greater trust in the Lord Jesus and a greater ability to commend the Lord Jesus to the, those around us. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.